while in the origin continuity the gun cannon was little more than a bipedal tank and not even worthy of being considered a mobile suit, the gun cannon from the mainline Universal Sentry was a completely different beast. Although this wasn't immediately evident from its first prototype, the RX-77 1A Gun Cannon A. The requirements for the plan were a mid-range support mobile suit with strong Luna Titanium armor that still had good mobility. The result was a heavy and well-armored machine that was based on the RXM-1 bipedal prototype and also had powerful weapons many of which would later become standard for the gun cannon line. It had 60mm Vulcans in the head, two shoulder mounted cannons, an optional 3 tube missile launcher and a handheld beam rifle, also making it the first mobile suit ever to use beam weaponry and giving it the firepower of a battleship. The only problem was with the mobility of the machine. So what followed were many tests to see where the armor could be reduced or reshapen to still maintain its defensive capabilities and increase that mobility. This would eventually turn into the RX-77-2 gun cannon that we all know today. A unit with thick armor where it counted without affecting its mobility too much. And while it wasn't as agile as the later RX-78-2 Gundam, the RX-77-2 still had enough mobility to somewhat hold its own in close combat. It could even get airborne for a little bit thanks to the thrusters on its back. The weaponry then remained largely the same. The shoulder mounted low recoil cannons were slightly overhauled and despite their power, the water cooled jackets around the barrels gave them a firing rate similar to that of the Zaku machine gun. However, with an ammo capacity of approximately 40 shots, the pilot had to be careful not to run out of ammo. And in some cases, those cannons, the head mounted Vulcan guns and the leg stored grenades were the only weapons that the pilot had access to. The luckier pilots then could also be issued a 100mm machine gun or the XBR M79A beam rifle. Essentially a sniper rifle that was made specifically for use by the gun cannon by the BOA Corporation. Compared to the one used by the RX-78 Gundam, it had a higher accuracy, but depending on the source, it seems that the range was largely the same, around 30 kilometers. It is said though that due to generator problems, the rifle initially couldn't be used, but these issues were later resolved at Luna 2. A lesser seen weapon of the gun cannon then were two spray missile launchers that could be mounted on the shoulders instead of the 240mm cannons. Each of the pods has 12 tubes with two missiles each, giving the gun cannon a grand total of 48 missiles, but even though a prototype is known to have existed, it's not known if these were ever used in actual combat. But all of this made the RX-77-2 gun cannon the first true Federation combat-ready mobile suit, and two units would be famously used by the 13th Autonomous Corps. And they wouldn't be the only ones using this excellent fire support unit. As opposed to the other V-Project prototypes, the gun cannon would actually see limited production as is, and for a short time, even functioned as the main Federation mobile suit. During this initial deployment then, another gun cannon known as the RX-77G gun cannon ground type also made its appearance. As you might have guessed, this was a ground combat version of the gun cannon made with spare parts of the V-Project prototype similar to the situation with the Gundam ground type. In addition to the weapons used by the regular gun cannon, the ground type also had a heat dagger and was sometimes also equipped with the same type of shield as the ground type Gundam and the ground type Jim. Something that the regular gun cannon typically wasn't seen with because it was believed that its armor was already plenty thick enough. One of the biggest differences then with the regular gun cannon was that the ground type no longer had the core block system. An escape system where inside of the torso of the V-Project machines a folded up core fighter was present that could be deployed by ditching the top and bottom of the mobile suit that it was in. This would ensure that the pilot could make an escape and return with the valuable test data 
should the mobile suit be damaged. This in turn then gave the ground type a quite different looking torso. Another difference was the performance of the ground type. This was unfortunately lowered due to a limiter that needed to ensure that this amalgamation of spare parts could function as required. Now these units would mostly see action in Australia and Asia, but would then later be phased out once the Jim Cannon and the Gun Cannon mass production version became available. Although with the exception of a few units, most of the Gun Cannon mass production types would be deployed in space. Whereas Jobro had favored to Jim Cannon and had started to steadily produce them in October, Luna 2 had begun research on a mass-produced gun cannon based on the RX-77-3 gun cannon heavy custom. Due to its late introduction into war and possibly due to serving a similar role as the Jim Cannon, the gun cannon mass production type only saw a limited trial production run before being succeeded by the Jim 2 in the post-war. Also, because it kept the RX in its model number, which was a model number that the Federation used for its prototypes, it has been speculated that it was never meant as a true mass production type, but rather as a prototype for a mass production version, which would then be another reason for its limited production. But putting that aside, as with the other mass production versions of the V-Project machines, several cost-saving measures were implemented while also trying to keep their impact on the performance as minimal as possible. It no longer had the core block system, the armor was now made out of a titanium ceramic composite rather than the stronger Luna titanium alloy, although its redesigned armor layout would ensure that its defensive capabilities didn't suffer too much, and finally it used many parts also used in the gym command line making production and maintenance much easier. Generally speaking, its performance was on par with the regular gun cannon and even managed to surpass it in some areas, at least on paper. Its mounted weaponry would also be redesigned. The 60mm Vulcans remained the same, but the grenades were omitted and the 240mm cannons were now replaced by a new type of cannon with barrels that could fold into the backpack to make close combat easier. It also simplified the complex loading mechanism, which had apparently been an issue that plagued the gun cannon. For handheld weaponry, it is most famously known for using the 90mm bullpup machine gun, but has also been seen using the 100mm machine gun and even the beam rifle used by the Alex Gundam. One feature then not seen on the regular gun cannon was the extendable stabilizer on the back skirt that granted the mass production type better stability and firing accuracy. Despite not always being shown in the most favorable light, the machine would see a lot of success in the hands of the famous Y Dingo team and one of the Federation's top aces, Lido Wolf. The RX-77-2 itself then would also be further developed, resulting in the RX-77-3 gun cannon heavy custom. And although you might think that this was a bulkier and slower unit, this was actually quite the opposite. Think more in terms of heavy duty and heavier weapons, such as a greater rate of fire and more ammo capacity for those 240mm cannons and a larger amount of hand grenades that were now stored on the hip. To compensate for that extra weight, the heavy custom was fitted with a new high performance backpack that succeeded in giving it higher mobility. Other upgrades then included slightly overhauled armor for better protection and increased stability when firing the main cannons. The heavy custom was a step in the right direction of meeting the Federation top brass's requirements of an upgraded gun cannon that was able to function in a group and also by itself. The two remaining issues for this goal then was increasing its stability for better firing and increasing the mobility just that little bit more. Because of this, the heavy custom would be produced, but it would only be in a limited number. All of that being said though, 
after the One Year War, some of the surviving heavy customs would be stationed at Jaburo, where they would still perform surprisingly well when the Ayug attacked it during the Grips conflict. These particular gun cannons had been upgraded with linear seats and were equipped with the then standard Federation beam rifle. Back during the One Year War then, some of these were used as test machines for a new type of beam cannon. Not only would it be lighter because it didn't have to carry any ammo, but it would also have less recoil. And it would seem that the tests here were satisfactory, as the beam cannon was later also mounted onto the Blue Destiny Unit 1 and the heavy custom successor unit, the Gun Cannon 2. Which was a name that was sometimes also used for the heavy customs equipped with the beam cannon, but confusing names out of the way, we'll talk more about the actual Gun Cannon 2 in a second. First, we must look at the Gun Cannon Heavy Type D, a successful attempt to give the heavy custom more mobility. And the solution for this seemed to be quite simple. Add some more thrusters here and there, tweak the armor a little bit, and voila! A gun cannon that was not just capable of operating as a mid-range support unit, but also as a general support machine with a much wider operating radius. The test runs confirmed this and the Heavy Type D was quickly approved by the Federation Brass as the gun cannon that met their expectations and was said to be mass produced. Or at least it would have been if it hadn't been for two things. It was expensive and only shortly after its rollout, another gun cannon would be completed. The superior and presumably cheaper RX-77 IV Gun Cannon 2. This was the final and best gun cannon of the One Year War thanks to the fact that it was built around that beam cannon that was tested out by the Heavy Custom. A lot of internal space was now freed up because there was no longer a need for things like ammo storage space or vents for the exhaust gases. This meant that the Gun Cannon 2 was lighter and that there was now the opportunity to overhaul its backpack with improved thrusters. All of this led to a surprisingly agile machine that could even do pretty far thruster jumps. However, despite its amazing performance, only a few machines would be produced at the recaptured California base. And while some sources claim that these machines never saw actual combat, it's more likely that they did participate in the subsequent recapture and mopping up operations of the North American continent. One final and obscure gun cannon then would appear after the One Year War, the RX-77 D2 Gun Cannon Mass Production Type Kai a mobile suit that was only made in small numbers through modifying existing late versions of the gun cannon mass production type. What exactly this so-called late version of the mass production type was, we don't know at the moment. And not much is known about the D2 either. It was only capable of operating on the ground, and compared to the Jim Cannon 2, it had lower mobility, but significant advantages in other areas. These are presumably things like sensor radius, firepower, and armor. One more unit then that you might be thinking about is the RGC-80 Prototype Jim Cannon. But that is a development history for another time. Because this has been all for the development history of the Gun Cannon, a machine that is often overshadowed by its more powerful sister unit, the Gundam but was nonetheless a very important unit for the Federation. And fortunately, its legacy would continue on with machines like the Gun Cannon Detector, the G Cannon, etc. These machines weren't developed directly from the Gun Cannon, but they certainly took design elements from it. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to leave a like and stay tuned for the next episode when we have a look at the Jim Cannon. As always, a big thank you to the Patreon supporters, I hope everyone watching has a great day, and I'll see you all next time!